we've been talking a lot about uh, the moon, where we've been in the past, where we are in the present, where we're going in the future. I want to talk about all of that as well, but I think I'm going to start with the past and just put forward that, as with many things, often before we all get there intellectually, scientifically, the lawyers get there first. And so a lot of people don't realize that outer space law has a long history. And so I'm going to be talking specifically, sorry, it's not showing on here. Okay, so that's good about who owns the moon. And I want to call into your mind that iconic image of Neil Armstrong planting a flag, a US flag, onto the surface of the moon in 1969. And I want you to think to yourselves, does that mean that the United States has any sort of ownership over the moon? Um, once we planted a flag in the moon, does that mean that the United States had any sort of ownership? And I provide you with some potential answers here. Does that mean that the United States had ownership? Does it mean that no one had ownership? Does it mean that the United Nations had some sort of ownership? <coughs> or does it mean that everyone had ownership? So you can think about that for a minute. And I'll move on to the answer. In fact, um, it's a bit of a combination of two. First of all, so, um, Sputnik went up in 1958, and then um, there was this plan for, to land on the moon. The United Nations actually began talking about who owned outer space around 1958. They established a committee called the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which still exists today. It's based out of Vienna. And they started to talk about establishing a, a treaty for the governance of outer space. And there were two main tenets within this, um, which suggest, sorry, let me get my nose right here. Um, am I not loud enough? Okay, sorry, apparently I'm not loud enough. Um, uh, first of all, so it's, a, it's sort of a bit of a mix of both. Um, in one sense, the answer is B, no one, because this treaty says that Outer space cannot be appropriated by any national state for sovereign purposes. And keep that particular wording in mind because I'm going to come back to it again a bit later. So in one sense, no one can own the moon or any celestial bodies or the vacuum of space, if you will. Um, in another sense, the answer is everyone because the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 says that outer space is the province of all mankind. Um, there are complicated reasons as to why the international community decided to agree on this particular treaty. This treaty was widely ratified and is still today accepted as being doctrine. Um, I don't have time to go into the details of that. If you're interested, there was a previous Cosmica lecture that I gave on why the international community decided to make outer space neutral territory, which you can look up through through the Cosmica website. But in essence, in 1967, it was established that outer space would be both not um, appropriable by any particular nation state and also that it was the common province of all mankind. So in one sense, it was for no one. In another sense, it was for everyone. Just as an aside, nonetheless, so this, this treaty was in place. Um, it was signed, it was went, uh, went into effect in 1967, but the discussions about it started in the 1950s. So by the time that the United States landed on the moon, it was very much uh, normatively in place. But nonetheless, the United States chose to put a United States flag on the moon. There were discussions about putting some sort of a global flag on the moon, but they decided to put a US flag on the moon. So it clearly has some sort of symbolic influence. Um, People don't realize this is the image that we're used to, but it's not the only flag, the only US flag on the moon. Um, I would ask you to think in your minds about how many flags there actually are on the moon, how many US flags there are on the moon. Um, in fact, there are one, two, three, four, five, six. 
six US flags on the moon, all delivered by humans. Those were delivered on the Apollo missions. The other things people don't realize, it wasn't only the US that got flag happy getting on the moon. Other countries decided to deliver flags onto the moon, even though it didn't mean anything legally in terms of appropriation. So my next question would you, for you would be, there are four other countries that have flags on the moon. If you think a minute. There's Russia. China. India. And the European Space Agency. So. I think it was France that launched the mission, but the European Space Agency also has a flag up there. Sorry, so, how does India have one? Did they do that? No. So, um, so um, Russia and China have soft landed on the moon and delivered flags in that way. The other thing to do is to crash something into the moon that has a flag on it. And so, again, despite the fact that this has no legal significance, four other uh, countries, including the European Union, if you call it a country, um, have delivered flags onto the moon. Um, just a, a, an image here. These are the um, soft landings that have happened on the moon. So a soft landing requires more technological capability. You bring something down softly. You can see these are the Soviet Union. This is the United States. China with the jade rabbit, which happened recently, is, is quite significant in having had a soft landing. But a lot of other countries have crashed stuff into the moon. Um, Speaking of crashing into the moon, this is something people, um, a lot of people don't realize. So again, going back to Kevin's presentation before, we think of the moon landing in this narrative that's very um, sentimental. But in fact, there's a lot of geopolitical um, activity that surrounded this, a lot of geopolitical interest behind this. And in fact, in 19, in the 1950s, the United States were thinking about landing on the moon. This was a great way to show the Soviets that they had all this technological prowess. They briefly considered, instead of landing on the moon, nuking it. <laughs> so we have this lovely picture of the moon. They were going to bomb it. Uh, there was actually a study that went into this. It was top secret at the time. And the idea was that it would have scientific purposes. Nuking the moon would give us a, a bit of understanding with the fallout of it, of what the geo, uh, geological makeup of the moon was. But also, the flash from the nuclear explosion was thought to be seen from the human eye, and it would create a difference in the surface of the moon that could be seen across the world, i.e. seen by the Soviet Union. <laughs> Something else I just want to mention. I know it's really nice to think about the moon landing in these romantic terms, but speaking of bombs, The first Apollo mission carried this plaque, which still stays on the moon, which says, here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969. We came in peace for all mankind. Um, if you think about your history, July 1969, what else was the United States transitioning a lot of their money into? The Vietnam War. Uh, there are, I mean, I, I think of these images of the moon as being the sublime, the things that humankind can only dream of doing. And at the same time, we, I say we, I've been in the UK for a long time, but the United States was also basically bombing the crap out of Vietnam. Um, this was around the time when we realized the um, My Lake uh, massacre and so on. So there are also all of these other iconic images that happen at the same time. So how do you reconcile this idea of we came in peace for all mankind with we were bombing the crap out of Vietnam. Uh, let me jump forward in my notes here, sorry. Um, yeah, 
So to my mind, luckily, we decided not to bomb the moon, but rather to land on it. Um, the last Ameri uh, human mission onto the, the moon was in 1972. Since then, there have been some soft landings. But there was sort of a hiatus in activity on the moon. Uh, again, there was some robotic activity, but the, the manned missions ended in 1972. So in legal terms, where are we now from, from them? And there are a couple of key issues that I think have come up. Um, one of the big ones is mining. Is it legal to mine the moon? One of the questions you have to ask ahead of that is, is it desirable? Is it, is it relevant? And scientifically, there are different opinions, opinions on this. Um, the moon potentially has helium-3, which could act as a resource to travel onto other planets um, as, a, as a, a fuel to travel onto other planets. It may have water. So there are some people who say that we should use the moon as a jumping off point to go beyond. There are other people who say we should just try to go straight on to Mars or other planets. So whether or not it's valuable to, to mine the moon in the first place is a question. But um, it does come up. This is a still from the movie moon, just called Moon from 2009, which is about this topic. Um, but ultimately, is it, is it legal? Um, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which I mentioned previously. So there's five main treaties that govern outer space. And I'm only going to talk about the two main ones that are, are relevant to the moon, um, the, the Outer Space Treaty is a bit ambiguous, really. Um, again, as I said before, it says that we should be pursuing uh, activity in outer space for the common heritage of mankind. Um, and there's a lot about um, activity there uh, benefiting all people in all countries, regardless of their scientific, technological, and developmental status. So there's a sense that anything that we would, could, could gain from mining should be redistributive. Um, in 1979, the, the fifth treaty, um, main outer space treaty was established, which was the Moon Treaty. And it sought to clarify some of these issues. It more or less failed. Um, no offense to, I was just looking, I think there's 14 countries that have ratified it. No offense to Uruguay and I think Palau, <laughs> which are two of the countries, but no main spacefaring nations ratified the treaty, which basically means that it failed. So that's not necessarily saying that the international community isn't interested in clarifying these issues, but that the treaty as it was written at that time didn't um, capture what it was that we, we wanted to um, determine about what would mean for mining resources. So if you go up to outer space, you mine resources, if you bring them back, do they cease to be celestial territory, in which case they're subject to appropriation? Um, if you mine them, are you obliged to redistribute the value of them amongst peoples across the world? It, it's really not clear. Um, and, oh, this has fallen off the screen, but I, I find it amusing. So China is one of the, the biggest players recently on the scene with regards to the moon. And in 2002, they stated their moon intentions. And those included establishing a base on the moon for the purposes of mining. And they said that the resources that they extracted would be for the benefit of humanity. What does that mean? Um, does that mean that the value that, that you get from that, um, you know, will we all get a pound in our pocket from it? I don't think that that's what's going to happen. But in essence, in the future, I think that mining is going to be one of the big issues, and it remains relatively unresolved. Just a quick aside, um, one of the other problems, I think, with the main treaties of outer space um, the main five outer space treaties is that they're rooted in a state-centric language. And this is because in the 1960s um, when, uh, and the 1970s when a lot of these were established, it was only states that were active in outer space. So I often get asked about these companies that sell plots of land on the moon and other celestial bodies for 20 quid. You can you know, have your retirement home on the Sea of Tranquility or whatever. Um, the reason for this is because if you go back to when I first was talking about the Outer Space Treaty, 
it says that no nation state may lay claim to a celestial body. And so these actors are saying, well, states can't lay claim, but individuals, corporations, private um, partnerships, those sorts of things can. So I don't think it would ever stand up in a court of law. Also, there are so many of these companies online, they've been, the plots of land on the moon have been sold many times over. So don't, don't book your travel plans anytime soon if you've bought one. Um, but that's w why, um, that's why th they're pursuing uh, those business opportunities as they are. And I think that this is one of the biggest issues in terms of outer space law right now, is because we're learning to deal with the fact that it's not just states that are going into outer space, but it's individuals, wealthy individuals, it's corporations, and it's some comb uh, combination of the two. And outer space law hasn't really developed in a way that's ready to uh, account for that. My last slide, I, I was trying to figure out how to finish with this. I realized this evening that I was last. And, um, you know, it's a full moon, and I was thinking, I've gone through the history, I've gone through the present, my speculations about the future, where does the, uh, this leave us now? Um, and I was thinking, well, it leaves us at the barge house on the South Bank. And Nicola said, you know, have an opinion, what, what is it that you really think about this? As an academic, I, I sort of have a mindset of being, dispassionate, but I guess if I were to leave you with anything, I would think one of the things that I think this project has done that's really amazing and that I also feel um, passionate about is that there are a lot of different discourses about um, what we should be doing with the moon, there's a lot of legal infrastructure, but there's still room for, I don't want to say resistance because that implies that it's, it's something already set in stone, but that you should think about what the moon means to you, and when you look up at it, um, what what you as an individual thinks um, it means to us. Humans have been doing this for centuries, and it's it's not something that we should lose. And that's why this this exhibition has been so great. So, thank you. Thank you. Dear. Thank you. I uh, have time for a couple of questions. Anyone? I think straight on the music. Uh, yeah. I yeah. Okay. Rob has a question. Oh. <laughs> uh, Jill, why did you think that China was not going to land on the moon when you lost that uh, bet for uh, a pint of beer with me? Rob's going to call me out on this. So. <laughs> Everybody was talking about the, the Jade Rabbit landing on the moon, and I, I was sure that, that that was premature. And in fact, I was on Al Jazeera um, TV, and I mentioned this bet, that I'd lost this bet. I have fulfilled my pint obligation, I would add. Um, China, it is interesting. I mean, the, 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 there's complicated politics behind this, but different countries are able to pursue their space programs in different ways because of their political infrastructure. So if you have a democracy, there's a lot more transparency in terms of the speed at which you pursue. Uh, she's been with us in a, a couple of previous Cosmicas in Liverpool and in Mexico City. So it's the first time we have her in London. And she's uh, an expert in space politics. She's also the editor of the, the Space Policy Journal, and she's a fellow in global politics at the London, London School of Economics. And today she's going to talk to us about who owns the moon. So you? Through Congress, there's a lot of budgetary constraints. There's pork barreling by individual senators and so on. When you have a country like China, and this is also the case um, with the Soviet Union, whereby they don't have those political constraints, they can move a lot faster. But when you have a controlled media, it's very difficult to tell where exactly they're at. And so um, it, it is hard to say how far and how fast China is, is going to go. Um, that, I mean, they can hopscotch the technology in, in some ways, but honestly, they're moving faster than I thought they would, and I am really curious to see where they go. And you're going to owe me a beer next time. <laughs>
Thank you, Drew.